Hey, fellow Whovians. And Mr. Men fans alike. Now, if you're fans of Mr. Men and or Doctor Who, preferably both for this series, because Roger Hargreaves has um, created a series of Mr. Men books based on each of the 13 Doctors from Doctor Who. And in the next 13 videos, I am going to read all 13 of these books. And we start with Doctor First. Here we go. Good morning, Grandfather, said Susan. Good? I don't think there's anything good about it, grumbled the Doctor. He was not in a good mood. And why was he not in a good mood? It was the TARDIS. It had been making clonking noises all night long and had kept the doctor awake. Something was wrong and the doctor knew that he was going to have to land somewhere and fix the problem. Yeah. There's the doctor and Susan at breakfast and the doctor is certainly not happy the nearest planet was earth the doctor did not like earth it was a small ugly planet populated by particularly irritating people or particularly Irritating and not very clever people, but the doctor had no choice. He and Susan landed in London. So there's the TARDIS hurtling towards Earth. The doctor was in one of those moods where he was best left alone. He set about fixing the TARDIS, and this put him in a better mood. He whistled as he worked. Whistling was something that the doctor rarely did. The TARDIS was soon mended and it was time to go. But where was Susan? Out exploring the city, no doubt. So yeah, the doctor's fixing the TARDIS there. The doctor waited and waited, and then he waited some more. He began to worry and decided that he had better go and look for Susan. He stepped out of the TARDIS and was immediately confronted by a group of strangely dressed people. The doctor was appalled by their casual dress sense. Ah yes, that's hippies. We can tell that's them. It says the doctor irritated by it. Hey man, what's your name? Asked one of the badly dressed people. The doctor, replied the doctor. Hi doc, nice to meet you. The doctor frowned. I am not doc, I am the doctor. I am a time lord. Wow, Groovy. The doctor frowned again. Groovy was another word he did not like. Yeah, there he goes. Irritated by one simple word. Groovy. The doctor had an awful feeling that all was not well, so he began his search for Susan. As he passed a dark alleyway, a movement caught his eye. There was something lurking in the shadows. The doctor's quick mind instantly suspected an alien. Cautiously, he crept down the alley. Suddenly, a door opened and the light from the doorway revealed that the shape in the shadows was a... So yep, yeah, there he is, searching down the alley for Susan.
cats. Yeah, a cat. Yep, <laughs> there you go. With a sigh of relief, the doctor returned to the street. He was still troubled. He could not put his finger on it, but he felt a strong sense that something wasn't right. And when he returned, and when he turned the corner, he discovered he was not wrong. He was right. There he is, worriedly walking down the street. It was Cybermen. They were in London. And they were not on holiday. Yep, uh, Cybermen. Um, sorry, I mean, Cyber Mr. Men. <laughs> oh, dear. The Doctor knew the Cybermen well enough to know that they were not sightseeing. Cybermen were not interested in the changing of the guard. Yeah, there we go, the changing of the guard going on and Cybermen not taking an interest. That's because they are robots. Cybermen were not interested in souvenirs. They were interested, no, what they were interested in was taking over the world. Okay, Cyberman's drinking a cup of tea. <laughs> the doctor ran for his life as the Cybermen fired their lasers at him. The doctor was not fast. He was far from the fastest thing on two legs. But he could still outrun the Cybermen. For in fact, the Cybermen could not run. So there's the Doctor running away from Cybermen, who we now know cannot run. And he's dodging the lasers. He had to find Susan. And as luck would have it, he found her in the next street. She was listening to some music on a radio, pop music. The doctor would not have described pop music as music. He would have described it as noise. The doctor frowned, but it gave him an idea. He made some quick adjustments to the radio. Okay, so there's the doctor with the radio. Susan shocked at what she's at what he's about to do. The radio waves drifted down the street, and the effect on the Cybermen was extraordinary. They were thrown into confusion. The wires crossed in their mechanical brains. Their legs jerked and their arms whirled. They did not know whether to take over the world or to dance. It was all too much for them. They turned tail and fled for their spaceship. Well, that does not look like a fleeing, uh, fleeing Cyberman to me. It looks like a dancing one. <laughs> Oh dear. The effect was equally dr equally dramatic on the doctor. He smiled. You're smiling, cried Susan in amazement. Nonsense, huffed the doctor. Time lords don't smile. And not for the first time that day, he, well, you can guess. That, well, can you guess? That's right. Okay, yeah, that is unmistakably a smile on the doctor's face. And look how happy Susan is. He frowned.
And that was Doctor the First. Who went to the next? Doctor Who, Mr. Men Adventure. Doctor the Second. In the next episode of this show. Until then. Thanks for watching. Okay, Whovians and Mr. Men fans alike, it's now time to carry on with the Mr. Men slash Doctor Who series with the second book, Doctor Second. Let's see how this goes, shall we? The doctor straightened his bow tie and stepped out of the TARDIS. Um, interesting, he murmured. It's a museum. It's a museum, said Victoria, following the doctor. Why are we here? I'm not sure, but the TARDIS brought us here, and if the TARDIS brought us here, it brought us here for a good reason. A very good reason. So there's the doctor and Victoria arriving in the museum but for what reason it's a shame that the tardis can't just tell us what that reason is said ja what that good reason is said jamie it's not very helpful what gasped the doctor I won't have anyone suggesting that the TARDIS is in any way deficient. It is a magnificent machine. The Doctor was very proud of the TARDIS. I was just saying it does have a habit of dumping us in the middle of danger and then leaving us to it. The Doctor glowered at Jamie and gave the TARDIS a pat. Yep. There you go. There's the Doctor and Jamie arguing, and there's the Doctor comforting the TARDIS. Now keep your eyes peeled, said the Doctor. What for? asked Jamie. Things, Jamie. Things that look unusual. Everything looks unusual, replied Jamie. We're in a museum. So there's Jamie looking at an exhibit right there. Yep. What is that exhibit? The three of them walked further into the museum, looking for the unnamed, unusual thing. It was not easy searching for something when you did not know what you were looking for in the first place. I'm getting the feeling that this is all a bit of a waste of time, said Jamie. So there's the Doctor, Victoria and Jamie searching through the museum and they're passing a woolly mammoth. Yeah, but they don't know what they're looking for. Don't be foolish, said the Doctor. The TARDIS is always right. You'll find out what it is any moment now. You mark my words. Yeah, the Doctor doesn't look too sure there, does he? Do you think began Victoria, that maybe just possibly the TARDIS was wrong. What? spluttered the Doctor. Wrong? The TARDIS is infallible. It is utterly reliable. Unlike that boy. Where's Jamie gone? Wandered off again, I suppose. 
Oh, no, no. There's something grabbing at Victoria. And the doctor's back is turned and angry. Maybe we should just go back to the TARDIS, suggested the doctor. But there was no answer. Victoria? Jamie? The doctor was all alone. Oh, my giddy arm! He exclaimed. Yeah, there you go. Realise he's alone and shocked. The doctor walked wearily on and round the next corner. He came to a Himalayan exhibit. There was a leopard and a mountain goat and a yak and a... Yep, there he is looking at the Himalayan exhibit. Yeti! Well, that's odd, said the doctor. I didn't think that yetis were. And then the yeti moved. Real? yelled the doctor. The yeti lunged at him and the doctor ran. There's the doctor running from a lunging yeti. Every way the doctor turned. He was confronted by yetis. He skidded into the medieval hall and knocked over a suit of armour. Crash! Which in turn knocked over another. Crash! The last suit in the row fell, revealing a yeti holding Victoria. Its poleaxe struck the yeti and knocked it over. So, a suit of armour rescuing Victoria. My dear girl, cried the doctor, are you alright? I am now, said Victoria, but we have to rescue Jamie. The doctor looked down at the fallen yeti. Look! It's not real. It's a robot. Somebody must be controlling them, said Victoria. But who? Yep, it's a robot yeti. But who's controlling them? Somebody with an evil plan, replied the doctor. Somebody with a remote control that is controlling the yetis. Would this help, then? asked Victoria, pulling out a TV remote. I was watching telly earlier. It's worth a try, said the doctor, aiming the remote control at the roaring yetis. The doctor pressed a button. The yetis fell silent, but continued to advance. Yeah, there they are, using a TV remote to silence the yeti. Hmm. Sorry, silly me. That's the volume button, said the doctor. Now, which one is the off button? Hang on, just a minute. Quickly, doctor, yelled Victoria. Suddenly, the yeti stopped in their tracks. Well done, doctor, cried Victoria. It wasn't me, said the doctor. I didn't press anything. Let's find Jamie, suggested Victoria. Okay, the doctor didn't press anything, but the yeti stopped in its tracks. The doctor and Victoria rushed through the museum until they found Jamie. He was standing next to a pyramid of glowing orbs. A yeti was serving him a drink on a tray. I think these beasties have made me their king, he said. It seems that this here pyramid is the yeti controller. And I am now in control. Oh my giddy aunt, exclaimed the doctor. Yeah.
just what I've read in the picture. Well, says Jamie, when they were back in the TARDIS, it was lucky I was here. This old thing wasn't going to do us much good. At that, he slapped the control desk. Oh, I will not have you criticising the TARDIS, cried the doctor. It is a wonderful piece of engineering. A veritable box of wizardry. A faultless mechanical miracle, except the chameleon circuit. Now let's get out of here. The doctor pressed the star button and... And nothing happened. Yep, there you go. The TARDIS had run out of energy. Magnificent, chuckled Jamie. Faultless, laughed Victoria. Oh, my giddy aunt, sighed the Doctor. And that was Doctor the Second. Now, these actually are written by Adam Argreaves. So, that was Doctor the Second. The next book along the Doctor Who line will be Doctor Third. And that's in the next episode. Until then... Oh, my giddy aunt. See ya. Hello, Mr. Men fans and Whovians alike. We continue the series of the 13 Doctors collection. That's Doctor Who, Mr. Men. Pardon me. And we now move on to Doctor Third. Here we go. The doctor had been out shopping and he was rushing back to his laboratory in Bessie, his little yellow car. No time to waste, he murmured to himself. So there's the doctor driving back to his lab in Bessie. The doctor was in a terrific hurry. Now Bessie was no ordinary car. The doctor had added a few special modifications, one of which was a hyperdrive button that would make Bessie travel at supersonic speeds. The doctor was about to press the button when he spotted someone waving on the other side of the road. Yeah, that looks like a policeman. What do you say, guys? Policeman, I call policeman. Okay, it's not a policeman. It was Mike Yates. His Land Rover had broken down. Hello, says Mike. Any chance of a lift? Yes, 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 said the doctor agitatedly. But make it quick. I need to get back to the lab as soon as possible. Blimey, sounds important, said Mike, jumping in. The doctor nodded. It is, he said, roaring off down the road. So he's now just picked up Mike Yates. Hitchhiking in Doctor Who, who would have thought it? Some sort of experiment, is it? Asked Mike. You might say that, muttered the doctor. The doctor was again about to press the hyperdrive button when he saw someone on the other side of the road. Again. Ah, now we know that's Liz Shaw. Okay, so it was Liz Shaw who was just coming out of the library. Her arms were full of very heavy-looking science books. That's Liz, said Mike. Looks like she needs a lift. Hell's bells, 
grumbled the doctor, pulling over to let Liz in. Make it quick, said Mike. The doctor's in a terrible hurry. Some sort of urgent experiment. So yeah, we've established that's Liz Shaw and she's carrying a whole pile of books. Really, said Liz. Anything interesting? Very, said the doctor, jamming Bessie into gear. I bet it's a top secret experiment, suggested Mike. Possibly, said the doctor tensely. For the third time that day, he was about to press the hyperdrive button when their journey was interrupted again. It was Joe Grant. And there she is, there's Joe Grant. They stopped to give her a lift. It was a very overloaded Bessie that set off again. A very overloaded and slow Bessie. Good grief, cried the doctor in exasperation. Is, is this starting to snow? asked Joe. It is, replied Mike. How cold? Snow in the, how odd. Snow in the middle of summer, commented Liz. That is definitely snow. I think it's getting worse, said Joe, and indeed it was. They were suddenly driving through a blizzard, and then, without any warning, Bessie skidded sideways and slid into a ditch. Blast! cried the doctor. In, consterna in consternation. Well, yeah, that's pushed it over the edge. As they were trying to lift Bessie back onto the road, a line of figures appeared on the ridge above them. Crikey, said Liz. Those are ice warriors. They must have made us know, said Mike. Ice warriors. Yeah, there you go. The ice warriors then raised their sonic disruptors and fired at the snowy slope, setting off a huge avalanche. Quick! cried the doctor. Everyone back in the car! So there's the ice warriors shooting their sonic disruptors. The avalanche thundered down the hill, threatening to engulf them. But at the last moment, the doctor hit hyperdrive. Bessie lurched forward and the avalanche lifted them up out of the ditch. The hyperdrive allowed them to surf on top of the avalanching avalanche. Sorry, the advancing avalanche. Sorry. So they're surfing on the avalanche there. Yeah. As the avalanche slowed, Bessie shot clear of the snow and back onto the safety of the road. Well done, Doctor, cried Mike, but the Doctor was still in a dreadful hurry. We must get back to the lab before it's too late, he cried. He screeched to a halt outside the lab and grabbed a grocery bag out of the car. The others followed excitedly wondering what amazing event they were about to witness. Yep, so there, there they are at the lab, about to go in. In the laboratory, they crowded around 
as the doctor pulled a tab out of a bag. That's ice cream! exclaimed Liz. What was all the rush about? asked Mike. The doctor pulled the lid off the tub. Bother! he cried, crestfallen. Melted ice cream, I take it. Yeah. Or maybe not. Yeah, it's melted. Mike and Liz and Joe all looked at the doctor. You mean that was what was so urgent? Laughed Joe. The doctor glowered at the tub of ice cream. <laughs> okay. Where's an ice warrior when you need one? He huffed. Well, there was one outside your laboratory window, Doctor. And that was Doctor Third. The next step in this series will be Doctor Fourth. And that will be read in the next episode. Until then, thanks for watching. Hi, Mr. Men fans and Whovians alike. It's now time to continue the Mr. Men Doctor Who series with the fourth in this series of books, Doctor Four. Here we go. Come along, Sarah cried the doctor. The doctor and Sarah Jane were running away. It seemed to Sarah Jane that the two of them spent an awful lot of their time running, and mainly running away. But what were they running away from this time? So yeah, there's the fourth doctor and Sarah Jane Smith running away. They were running away from the Daleks. Seek, locate, exterminate, grated the Daleks in their metallic voices. Daleks don't run, but they do chase. The Daleks were a terrible alien race intent on just one thing, to destroy, to exterminate. So there's the Dalek uh, running after the Doctor and Sarah Jane. Oh, to exterminate everything. Although some Daleks were rather better at exterminating than others, like Number Z four o three, better known to his friends as Dale. Dale the Dalek's energy ray was not so convincing. Yeah, pretty feeble Dalek compared to the rest, wouldn't you say? <laughs> what are we going to do? Puffed Sarah Jane. That's simple, cried the Doctor. Keep running and don't get exterminated. Which, it had to be said, made perfect sense. If we can get to the TARDIS, then we can lead the Daleks away from this planet, said the Doctor, skidding around a corner into an alleyway. So yeah, there you see this, the end of the Doctor's scarf disappearing around the corner into an alleyway, and there's Sarah Jane. Obviously scared. Doctor, that's a dead end, warned Sarah Jane. What are we going to do? Climb the ladder, of course, said the doctor. 
and to Sarah Jane's surprise, there was indeed a ladder. But how did you know? began Sarah Jane. Keep up, Sarah, said the doctor, clambering over the wall, and don't forget to pull the ladder up behind you and bring it with you. So there's the doctor already over the wall, and Sarah Jane climbing the ladder. The wall stopped the Daleks, but not for long. The Daleks did not need a ladder. In fact, Daleks don't climb ladders. Daleks have energy rays. And in a matter of moments, they had exterminated the wall. So yeah, there's a Dalek coming through a hole in the wall. Sarah Jane and the doctor came to a wide river. There was a drawbridge, but the control lever was on the other side. Would you like a jelly baby? asked the doctor. I don't think this is the moment for handing out jelly babies, she cried in exasperation. Not you, said the doctor, that pigeon. Sure enough, one of the pigeons did want a jelly baby. As it took off, it knocked the drawbridge lever and the doctor and Sarah Jane were able to safely cross the river. So there's the doctor offering this pigeon here a jelly baby. And yes, sure enough, there's the drawbridge gone down. What a helpful bird. With the drawbridge raised once again, they had escaped one of the Daleks. Daleks don't swim. And they don't like jelly babies. In fact, the list of things that Daleks can't do is long. But not as long as the list of the things that Daleks don't like. Yep, so there you go, Daleks can't get across water. They don't like kittens, they don't like flowers, they don't like ice cream. And they definitely don't like tennis. There is only one thing Daleks like, and that is exterminating things. <laughs> Daleks playing tennis. And yeah, it quite clearly states here that they definitely don't like tennis. <laughs> you just heard me read it. But the Doctor and Sarah Jane were now faced with more Daleks blocking the road ahead. Now where has it gone? said the Doctor. Where has what gone? asked, the, asked Sarah Jane. Really, Sarah, you must keep up. And there it is. Sarah Jane was becoming more puzzled by the minute as they climbed onto the bicycle that the Doctor had been looking for. So there they are on the bike, and yes, yeah, Sarah Jane was more puzzled. Pedal faster, cried the doctor as they weaved between the Daleks standing in the road, avoiding the energy rays. There was only one Dalek close enough to stop them. Luckily, it was Dale. Yeah. And there you go again, his feeble energy ray can't even hit them. What? Some Dalek. Once they had avoided the Daleks, they came to another road. A very busy road. Fortunately, there was a stop sign that held back the traffic, and the Doctor and Sarah Jane pedalled across. 
that there was nothing to stop the Daleks from doing the same, or was there? Beside the stop sign was a bucket of paint and a brush. Yeah, it'd be what an odd thing to have by a stop sign unless you were going to jazz up the sign. And that road doesn't look very busy to me. Well, that's lucky, cried Sarah Jane, grabbing the brush and painting over the stop sign. Luck, said the doctor. Nothing to do with luck. It's called good planning. Don't forget the paint bucket. Yeah. So there's uh, Sarah Jane painting over the stop sign. Now that the traffic was no longer held back by the stop sign, the cars ro roared off, and by the time the Daleks reached the road, it was too busy to cross. Ha! Ah, there you go, traffic stopping the Daleks. Finally, they reached the TARDIS. What on earth did you make me bring all this stuff along with us? Sarah Jane asked. Sorry, why on earth? Why on earth did you make me bring all this stuff along with us? Sarah Jane asked. Well, there is a perfectly obvious reason. If we did not bring these things along, then how would we be able to get back and leave them for us to find later? The doctor replied. Well, that's about as clear as mud, cried Sarah Jane. I do have a time machine, and I am a time lord, so I can go back in time and practice. Hmm, yeah. TARDIS, time lord, companion. As we all know, practice makes perfect. And I never travel anywhere without a jelly baby. And that was Dr. Fork. Join me next time. As the Doctor's adventures continue in the form of Mr. Men's stories. With Dr. Fifth. Until then, bye. Hello fellow Whovians and Mr. Men fans alike, and welcome to the fifth episode of the Doctor Who Mr. Men series. And of course that now means I'll be reading Doctor Fifth. So here we go. It had been a very long day, but five minutes in, the zero room would set the doctor right. That's just what the doctor ordered, announced the doctor when he awoke. Although I do feel a bit peckish, I fancy a snack. So obviously he's in the zero room right there, which means he's just regenerated. <laughs> okay. So yeah, there you go. It's the doctor in the zero room. We're all out of food, said Nissa, looking in the fridge. Not a sausage. We'd better pop down to Earth and restock, said the doctor. So, okay, there's Nissa telling the doctor they, know they have no food left. And the doctor saying they need to go to the shop. The doctor let Adric take the TARDIS controls and they landed in the car park of a supermarket. 
Well, that's not the cleverest bit of parking I've ever seen, said Tegan. At least I'm allowed to fly the TARDIS, said Adric, bristling. Now, now, said the Doctor, no bickering, please. So there are Tegan and Adric bickering. They all walked into the supermarket where the doctor had the strangest feeling. He could have sworn that he had seen this little old lady pushing a shopping trolley before. There was something very familiar about her. Maybe it was the beard. Bearded lady pushing a shopping trolley in a supermarket. should be in a freak show. However, the doctor was quickly distracted by the thought of what to eat. They wandered from aisle to aisle. They peered down the canned foods aisle. We're not going down there, declared the doctor. That's the sort of canned food I would like to avoid. Yeah, because look, there's a Cyberman down the aisle. <laughs> so yep, yeah, there you go. <laughs> How about a pizza? suggested Missa. Perfect, agreed the doctor. Adric rushed ahead to the freezer section to have a look. Can you help me? Well, can you help me? asked the little old lady when he got there. Adric happily opened the freezer door for her. So there's Adric helping the old lady. The bearded old lady. Who do we think that could be? Where's Adric got to? We should stick together. Com no. yeah. Where's Adric got to? We should stick together. Complained Tegan. I have discovered living with the doctor. That going off on your own only leads to trouble. There they all are, worried about Adric. And, sure enough, when they got to the freezer section, Adric was in trouble. He was trapped in a freezer. I knew it cried Tegan. Quick, let's get him out, said the doctor. But as they opened the door, the little old lady rushed at them from behind and knocked them into the freezer with her trolley. They were all trapped. So there they are, getting uh, pushed into the freezer. Well, I think we can safely say this is all Adric's fault. Sorry. Well, I think we can safely say that this is all Adric's fault, said Tegan. Adric glowered at her. Or at least he tried to, but his face was frozen. <laughs> yep, frozen Adric in the freezer. There you go. Fooled you, cried a voice from outside the freezer. It was the master, gleefully waving a little old lady's wig and dress. Welcome to my trap. I knew I recognized you from somewhere, exclaimed the doctor. But there's the master. Well, oh, not such a surprise reveal. Doctor, I'm c c cold, stuttered Missa. Brave heart, Missa, said the doctor, pulling out his sonic screwdriver. Let me guess, a sonic screwdriver to the rescue. What a surprise, mocked Tegan. Stand back, 
cried the doctor. Easier said than done in a breather, muttered Tegan. Then the doctor blasted the freezer door off his hinges. Good old Sonic. Not that one. They leaped from the freezer to discover all the shelves in the supermarket had been moved around. The master has rearranged the store, said Nick, cried Nissa, and she was right. The master had created an impossible maze. It's my trap within a trap, laughed the master. You'll never find your way out. Yeah, amazing, isn't it? Amazing a supermarket. What we need, said the doctor, is a bag of frozen peas. Frozen peas? questioned Adric. What a ridiculous suggestion! But he was wrong, because as they explored the maze, the doctor left a trail of peas so they knew where they had been and were able to find a way out. A trail of frozen peas to help you find your way out of the maze. Okay. To the TARDIS! cried the doctor as they escaped from the supermarket. But the TARDIS was nowhere to be seen. The pickup truck had driven away. They ran around the car park, searching for some sign of it. There! cried Nissa suddenly. And there was the TARDIS emerging from a car wash on the back of the pickup truck. There you go. <laughs> once they had got to the TARDIS, uh, once they had got the TARDIS back from the truck driver and were safely aboard, the doctor retired to the zero room for a much needed rest. It had been a long day. Five minutes later, he appeared refreshed and restored. Just what the doctor ordered, he said, although... Yep, there he is, fully refreshed. But that although... I do feel rather peckish. <laughs> okay, that's it for Doctor Fifth. In the next episode, I will read Doctor Sixth. Until then... Thanks for watching. Hello, Whovians and Mr. Men fans alike. And it's now time to continue the Mr. Men Doctor Who crossovers. Well, actually, reimagining series. In episode 6, which is this episode, we're going to be reading Doctor 6. Here we go. The Doctor and Perry were travelling through time in the TARDIS when the Doctor suddenly looked concerned. This is most unusual, cried the Doctor. Time is being twisted. But how do you know? asked Perry. How do I know? spluttered the Doctor. Look. Look at the clock. The twisted clock. That is all you need to know, isn't it, guys? And there's the Sixth Doctor and Perry, right there. Quick, we must land! The TARDIS is twisting! It can't travel through twisted time, exclaimed the Doctor. He then steered the TARDIS towards the nearest planet. A twisted TARDIS! I wonder who's behind this. Oh, 
unknown to the Doctor and Perry, there was another TARDIS that had already landed on the planet. Another TARDIS and another Time Lord. Or rather, Time Lady. The Rani. Yep, there you go. The Doctor and Perry stepped out of their TARDIS and went to explore the planet. It was quite, it was a quite unusual place, but in a strangely familiar way. I think this is the blue planet, said the Doctor. You don't say, laughed Perry. Yep, the planet is most definitely blue. We must find what is causing time to twist so catastrophically. It is a conundrum that presently bamboozles me, but I have absolute confidence that I shall achieve a positive solution, announced Doctor. So what are you trying to say in your long-winded way that you are going to sort everything out? No, so what am I trying to say? in your long-winded way, is that you are going to sort everything out? said Perry, grinning. You could say that, but it is not so eloquent, huffed the Doctor. Uh, they both gave long-winded explanations there, didn't they? Hmm. Suddenly, they were surrounded by a crowd of locals. A crowd of angry-looking locals. Angry blue locals. They don't look very friendly, remarked the doctor. Well, no kidding. <laughs> of course they don't look friendly. Doctor, what's happening? cried Perry. Are they taking us prisoner? I have a suspicion that we are about to find out who is behind all this, said the doctor. There's an ambush if I ever did see one. And the doctor, who was rarely ever wrong, was right. The Rani! He cried as the crowd parted to reveal the Rani. Hello, old friend, the Rani greeted him. Having trouble with your TARDIS? Oh, I wouldn't exactly call them friends, would you? We've, um, we just met her a few pages back. That's the Rani. So it is you who was twisting time, exclaimed the doctor. Look, Perry, rather than a key, she used a corkscrew to wind up the time continuum. Yeah, there she is using a corkscrew. Pretty okay, well, okay. I can't really call it useless if... This ended up being the opposite of that. And she has hypnotised all these poor locals and taken control of their minds, he added, getting redder in the face every sec uh, by the second. The doctor puffed out his chest and threw back his head. You despicable, vile creature! He bellowed. Oh dear. A boiling anger had grown in the doctor, and he now roared and thundered all his rage at the Rani. The force of his anger was so great that he shook the crowd of locals right out of their hypnosis. 
the Rani lost her control of their minds and the locals of the blue planet were once again free. Yep, there's the Doctor's anger freeing the blue people from the Rani's control. The Rani, realising that all her plans were lost, turned on her heel and ran. Stop her! ordered the Doctor, but it was too late. The Rani had disappeared. The Doctor asked the crowd to go and capture the Rani's TARDIS so that she could not escape from the planet. And there's the Rani running away. While his orders were being carried out, the Doctor carefully removed the corkscrew from the time continuum and rewound it with the correct key. There you go, you've been fixed. You really outsmarted the Rani, said Terry. I did, didn't I, said the Doctor, beaming proudly. Still, when you have a brain as prodigiously clever as mine, it's not so difficult. Unlike a little modesty, murmured Terry. What's that? spluttered the doctor. Oh, nothing, said Terry. I was just mentioning your... your... honesty. She actually said modesty. Yeah, so... <laughs> As the Doctor and Terry were returning to their TARDIS, they heard a sudden cry. Come back with my TARDIS! It was the Rani chasing after a crowd of locals who were carrying off her TARDIS. Well, there you go. She's besieged and stuck on the planet. Having trouble with your TARDIS? The Doctor cried with a smile. And that was Doctor Six. In the next episode, I will be reading the seventh book in this series, Doctor Seven. Until then... Thanks for watching. Hi, Whovians and Mr. Men fans alike. And welcome to the episode 7 of the Mr. Men Doctor Who series. Now we're on to the 7th book, Doctor 7th. Here we go. The Doctor and Ace were on a walk through the woods. They were going to meet the Doctor's friends for tea. You're going to love it, said the Doctor. And you're going to love my friends. So there they are, the Doctor and Ace walking through the woods. I don't see why we didn't just take the TARDIS, complained Ace because there is nothing like a walk through the woods in the fresh air, explained the doctor. It's boring, that's what it is, agreed Grace. Sorry, disagree Grace. A boring walk to see your boring old friends. Nonsense. It will be fun, said the doctor. And there they are, having a disagreement about it.
However, when they reached the doctor's friend's house, there was no one at home. How strange. I definitely arranged to meet for tea at three o'clock today, said the doctor, looking at his watch. And it most definitely... And it is most definitely three o'clock, and quite positively today. Maybe they couldn't face the thought of how boring it was going to be, suggested suggested Ace unhel unhelpfully, un yeah, unhelpfully. And there she is mocking him. Ace is the green one, by the way. It was then that the doctor spotted some fresh footprints leading away into the woods. And one set of the footprints were those of a huge cat. Well, this just went from boring to interesting, said Grace. They set off in pursuit. So yeah, there they are, footprints leading back into the woods. They had not gone far when two figures leaped out, blocking their path. Goodness gracious, cried the doctor. It's the cheetah people. Blimey, from interesting to exciting in a matter of moments, I, I think I can hold them off, shouted Grace, rummaging through in her bag. I don't think that's wise, said the doctor. Cheetah people. Hmm, I don't, don't think I've ever seen any of those in Doctor Who before. Hmm. The Doctor and Ace dived off the path and sprinted through the undergrowth down into the ravine. However, their escape route was blocked by a fallen tree. Oh my, said the Doctor. Now we're in a pickle. No problem. Things have just gone from exciting to fun, said Ace, pulling a stick of dynamite from her bag. Let's blow it up. I don't think that's wise, said the doctor. We'll have to climb out. Yep, yeah, there it is. Uh, Ace with a stick of dynamite in her hands. And of course the doctor disagreeing. At the top of the ravine, they saw a figure a little way off. There's someone who might help, said the doctor. But then the figure turned around. I wonder who that could be. Let's find out. We're not going to get any help from him, said Ace. Oh dear, you're right, agreed the Doctor. That's the Master. It certainly is. There he is again. The Master. Look at that rock. We could blow it up and trap him, suggested Ace. I don't think explosives are really necessary, said the doctor, picking up a pine cone and tossing it at the rock. I can't see what good that's going to do. Can you? The rock was so precariously balanced that it took only the extra weight of the pine cone to bring it tumbling down, causing an avalanche. Clever, admitted Ace, but an explosion would have been more fun. Yeah, I don't disagree with her there, but also it would have been more dangerous. <laughs> That's what I just said, guys. The 
Doctor and Ace continued cautiously through the woods until they came to the edge of a clearing. When it became clear just what the cheetah people were doing on Earth. Yeah, where it became clear, sorry. They had captured the Doctor's friends. What we need is this, said Ace, grinning and holding up a stick of dynamite. What we need is a carefully thought out plan, said the Doctor. I think this calls for a bit of old magic. A bit of old magic, eh, to free the Doctor's friends? Yeah. I see what you mean. A short while later, the Doctor stepped into a clearing. Into the clearing. Roll up, roll up, he called. Prepare to be amazed. Prepare for marvellous acts of magic. And preposterous powers. And... Press... Prestic... Prestic in it. What? Press... Prestigitate... Prestigitation. And astonishing feats of conjuring. Took me a while to wrap my, wrap my tongue around that word. <laughs> With that, the doctor produced a length of rope from thin air and proceeded to perform a series of magic tricks. I had no idea the Seventh Doctor was a magician. The Cheetah people gathered round in amazement and confusion. The Doctor finishes that by making the rope stand on end in mid-air. Now I just need the help of a member of the audience, he said. You, sir, might I ask you to pull on the end of this rope? Oh, he's getting a cheetah person's help. I think that's all going to go wrong, don't you? One of the cheetah people stepped forward and pulled on the rope. A huge net fell from the branches above, trapping the cheetah people and allowing Ace to release the doctor's friends from the cage. Yet they are most definitely trapped, those cheetah people. Naughty, naughty cheetah people. Ah, oh, Professor, said Ace, looking sadly at her stick of dynamite. All that action, but I didn't get to blow anything up. True, said the doctor with a smile. But at least it wasn't... Yeah. But she can't complain she didn't have any fun. Boring. And that was Doctor Seventh, guys. Next episode, I'll be reading Dr. Eighth. Until then, thanks for watching. Hi, who the ends of Mr. Men fans alike? It's time for the eighth episode in the 13 Doctors collection. Dr. Eighth. Are you ready? Here we go. While travelling through space and time in the TARDIS, the Doctor received a distress call from a spaceship. The, shell, the ship was about to self-destruct. Oh, yes. There it is. The uh, spaceship is about to self-destruct. Sending a, spell, um, um, hmm, a, a distress call to... The time and relative dimensions in space. TARDIS. <laughs> yep.
The doctor landed aboard the ship and tried to persuade the spaceship computer to stop, but the computer had made up its mind, and there was no arguing with it. You're a very stubborn computer, cried the doctor as he, yeah, as he searched for the ship's crew. And you are a very stubborn person, replied the computer. The ship will now explode in three minutes. Yes, the doctor trying to reason with the computer. Of course, it's going to be a shambles. How about adding on an extra minute? Asked the doctor as he opened the hatchway with his sonic screwdriver. The ship will explode in two minutes, replied the computer. Blast you! exclaimed the doctor. That is my plan, said the doctor, un said, the said the computer unhelpfully. Well, yeah. There's the doctor still arguing with the computer. Uh, who's that watching in on them? The doctor raced through the spaceship, leading to the ship's crew to the TARDIS. Leading the ship's crew to the TARDIS. The ship will explode in one minute, declared the computer. Quickly, everybody, inside, cried the doctor. And there's the doctor ushering the crew into the TARDIS. Five, began the computer. The doctor closed the TARDIS door. Four, continued the computer. The doctor turned the TARDIS on. Three, the doctor flipped a switch. Two, and that was the last they heard from the computer as the TARDIS escaped the spaceship in just the nick of time. Boom. There you go. <laughs> the doctor looked around at the spaceship's crew. I think everybody needs a holiday, he suggested, and I know just the place. A very short time later, but a very long way across space, the TARDIS landed on a beach on Earth. Yeah, okay, well, there's the doctor flying them away. But when the crew stepped out onto the beach, they all suddenly ran away. Well, there's gratitude for you, huffed the doctor. There's just no pleasing some people. And then he looked over his shoulder and saw why everybody had run away. Oh my, he exclaimed. It's the... There he is on the beach thinking that... People he's just saved were ungrateful, but we're about to see the reason why they ran away. Silurians! And indeed it was. A whole crowd of them advancing up the beach. Well, what can I do for you? asked the doctor, hoping that there was nothing he could do for them. This beach is ours, cried the Silurian leader. Fair enough said the doctor. I'll just be on my way then. But the Silurians had something else in mind. They surrounded the doctor and the TARDIS. Yeah, there you go. There's the Silurians. The sea devils have claimed this beach as theirs, but they live in the sea and we live on the land. So the beach must be ours, said the Silurian leader. Only if you help us will we allow you to leave. So the Silurian leader's bargaining with the doctor. Hang on a minute. The sea devils claim this beach as theirs, but they live in the sea. <laughs> it states the obvious in the book. <laughs> Oh dear. <laughs> hmm. 
Now, as you run, uh, now as you may or may not know, the Silurians and the Sea Devils were cousins, although they were equally ugly. The last thing the Doctor wanted was to get involved, or to get involved in, was an alien family squabble. But it seemed that he had no choice. Okay, so there's a Silurian and a Sea Devil um, arguing. The Doctor rode out to see what he could do. Well, sorry, the Doctor rode out to sea to see what he could do. The Doctor went to see, 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 see what he could do, 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 and all that he could do, do, do. <laughs> I'm sorry, I couldn't resist that. <laughs> he asked the Sea Devils if they would give up the beach. Never! bellowed the Sea Devil leader. It is ours. When the tide goes in, the beach is covered with water, so it is ours. Yeah, there's no bargaining with these guys. <laughs> <laughs> the doctor rode back to the Silurians and reported the Sea Devil's answer. But when the tide goes out, the beach is land, so it is ours. The doctor scratched his head. It was quite a problem. And then he had an idea. Yep, okay, there's a little light bulb going off in the doctor's head. It is all very simple, exclaimed the doctor. When the tide comes in, then the sea devils can swim here. Oh, the sea devils are happily swimming like little human children. <laughs> and when the tide goes out, then the Silurians can play here. You can share the beach. And there's the Silurians building sandcastles and playing ball. <laughs> oh dear. The Silurians looked at the Sea Devils. And the Sea Devils looked at the Silurians. Well, actually, that does make sense, said the Silurian leader. Yes, it does, agreed the Sea Devil leader. Now that was easy, declared the doctor. How about a game of volleyball to celebrate, he suggested, picking up a beach ball lying on the sand. The doctor playing volleyball with the sea devils and the Silurians. Who knew? <laughs> That's our ball, cried the Silurian leader. No, argued the sea devil leader. That is our ball. Oh dear, sighed the doctor. Time to leave. And that was Doctor Eight. Next time, Doctor Nine. Until then, I thank you for watching. Hi Whovians and Mr. Man fans alike, it's time for episode 9 of the 13 Doctors collection, so we're now up to Doctor Ninth. Here we go. It was a lovely sunny day and the Doctor decided to go shopping in town. The first stop he came to was a clove shop. Ah yes, the doctor going shopping at a clothes shop right there in front of us, yep. Good morning, said the doctor. Hello, my name is Rose, said the woman who worked in the shop. How can I help you? I was thinking about buying a hat, replied the doctor. I'd like to look at that one. 
He pointed to the one. He pointed to one of the shop mannequins. Although, there is something rather familiar about it. I'm not sure that one really suits you, said Rose. Yeah, can you see what's so familiar about that hat, Hovians? One of the other doctors wore it. There you go. Uh, there's Rose greeting the doctor. I'm telling him that the hat doesn't suit him. As she turned to show the doctor some other hats, the mannequin suddenly moved its head and then, without warning, it tried to grab Rose. Luckily, the doctor grabbed her first as all the other mannequins came to life. The Autons! That is who the villains are here, guys. The living plastic. So there's an Auton grabbing at Rose. And I like the fact they've made her pink. We got to escape! exclaimed the doctor, pulling Rose out to the street. But what's going on? cried Rose. They've turned into Autons, cried the doctor, running into Mr. Socket's electrical shop next door as the mannequins chased them. <laughs> Mr. Socket! <laughs> okay, 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 there we go. So there they are running into the electrical shop with an Auton chasing them. That's the Auton there. The doctor used his sonic screwdriver to switch on all the machines in the electrical shop. That should distract them for a moment, he said. The whirling blenders and popping toasters and tumbling tumble dryers gave the doctor and Rose time to escape from the electrical shop and into Miss Dinky's toy shop. Miss Dinky. <laughs> yeah, the Auton is definitely distracted. I would have thought they would have given that to a donut shop. How is this happening? asked Rose. Autons do not act on their own. The nesting consciousness brought the mannequins to life. They can animate any plastic object, explained the doctor. They must have a transmitter somewhere, and that is what we need to find to stop them. It's a shame they can't bring other things to life, like a jam jar, or like a jam tart. A jam tart wouldn't be scary, said Rose. I'm not so sure about that, Rose. There she is, uh, apparently here, holding a live jam tart by the head. Or by, by the crust. Um, it's pastry. That looks pretty scared to me. Or scary. Any, anything that's not normally alive coming to life would be scary. <laughs> Rose peered anxiously out of the window. Oh no! She cried. The Autons have caught someone. That's not just someone, said the doctor. That's my friend Jack. Quick, we have to help him. With a wave of his sonic screwdriver, the doctor activated all the toys in the shop. Yep, there they are. The toys all coming to life. And if I'm not mistaken, that's Captain Jack. Harkness, that is. He didn't appear as early as episode one of Christopher Eccleston's era. <laughs> okay. The toys raced out of the shop. Under the control of the Doctor Sonic, they freed Jack, and under the control. 
That's a very handy toy," said Rose. "This is not a toy," said the doctor. "This is a sonic screwdriver." There they are, the toys all coming to life, and attacking the Auton. Now it's scared. Rose, I'd like you to meet Captain Jack Harkness. Jack, this is Rose," said the doctor. "Nice to meet you, Rose," said Jack. "Doctor, I think the Arton transmitter is up on that roof." Jack pointed to the roof above Mrs. Sprout's greengrocers. Mrs. Sprout, clearly, guys, <laughs> seriously, guys, where they could see more Autons looking down at them. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Mrs. Sprout. And there are the autons on the roof. And there's Captain Jack. Looking up at them angrily. Yes, where they could see some more autons looking down at them. What we need are cabbages," announced the doctor. "Cabbages," said Rose with a puzzled look. "Yeah, don't blame her." "Yes, cabbages and lots of them," added the doctor. So the three of them grabbed as many of Mrs. Sprout's cabbages as they could carry, and climbed up to the fire escape to the climbed up the fire escape to the roof. What are they going to do with all those cabbages? Do you reckon? <laughs> shall we find out? Yeah, I think we shall. On the roof, they found a group of autons guarding the control device. How's your aim? asked the doctor, and then he threw a cabbage. It sailed through the air and hit an auton square on the head, knocking it clean off. Yep, there's a cabbage knocking off an auton's head. Wow. Remember, they are only mannequins," cried the doctor. Rose threw a cabbage and knocked another head off. Fantastic," said the doctor with a grin. Yeah, there you go. Rose attacking an Auton with another cabbage. Yeah, cabbage. In no time at all, the doctor and Rose and Jack had knocked off all the heads of all the Autons. And then the doctor disabled the Auton transmitter with a cabbage. <laughs> okay, using a cabbage to disable the auton transmitter. There you go, it's right there. <sighs> okay. What a mess! Sighed Rose. How am I ever going to get the shop straightened out? What are you saying? Exclaimed the doctor. Here we are, just saved the whole world, and you're worrying about a shop. Couldn't you just wave your sonic thingamajig and clean all this and clean this all up? It is not a magic wand," said the doctor. Now I think we all deserve a cup of tea back in the TARDIS. What's the TARDIS? Asked Rose. 
You will have to wait and see, the doctor said, grinning. Yeah. Hmm. <clears throat> Rose worrying about a shop and they've just saved the world. Rose was amazed by the TARDIS, or rather, she was amazed once she entered it. How is it bigger on the inside? she exclaimed. Ah, that's my little secrets, answered the doctor. Yep, yeah, there you go, the first look at the inside of the TARDIS. From the first era, I'm sure many of you modern Whovians would have seen. Uh, pardon me. Because it was also the look of the 10th Doctor's TARDIS. Something I like to keep under my hat, Rose laughed. If you have brought one, uh, if you have, if you had bought one, that is. And that, my friends, was Doctor Ninth. Next time we go up to Doctor Tenth. Until then, you are fantastic viewers, and I thank you for watching. Hello fellow Whovians and Mr. Man fans alike, and it's now time to dive in to the 10th story of the 13 Doctors Mr. Men collection. That is, of course, Doctor Tenth. Here we go. The Doctor was enjoying a well-earned holiday on a far-off planet. A far-off planet where peace and quiet were the order of the day. The perfect planet for a holiday. Or so the Doctor hoped. But the Doctor's hopes were quickly shattered by the arrival of an alien spaceship. So there's the Doctor trying to uh, relax beneath the alien spaceship arriving. It was the Sontarans, all dressed in armour and looking for trouble. We claim this planet in the name of Sontar declared General Stahl, their commander. The Sontarans immediately started to round up the local people. Ooh, yeah, this is what the Sontarans do in the actual Doctor Who show, guys. Not uncommon practice for the Sontarans. Hang on a minute, cried the Doctor. You can't just wander around space claiming planets as your own willy-nilly. I will happily fight you for this planet, suggested General Stahl. I'm not going to fight you, said the Doctor. Then you are a coward. You are weak, and I am strong. Well, if we are going to swap insults, then I would suggest you look like a photo and are rather short. Sorry, then I would suggest you look like a potato and are rather short, said the doctor. Yeah, swapping insults there, the doctor and a Sontaran. You look like a photo and are rather short. <laughs> oh dear, I've just created a new vegetable. The photo. <laughs> Short, fluttered the general, who in a sudden fit of rage lunged at the doctor. The doctor leaped back, and the two of them tumbled down a steep hill. Bump, bump, bump. All the way to the bottom. So there they are, tumbling down the hill. At the bottom of the hill was a deep pit, and lurking in the pit 
was an organ, a fierce alien being. Oh dear, they're about to be running into more trouble. An organ, I think that is. The doctor desperately grabbed hold of a root growing out the side of the hill. And as General Stahl plummeted past him, the doctor caught him by the hand, saving him from the clutches of the organ. So the doctor's now saving the Santaran general from the organ. What is the organ? Why did you save me? I am your enemy, said the general once they were safe. You are not my enemy, said the doctor. I just want you to go home and leave this planet in peace. As the doctor would. Give the enemies another chance to leave. It was a long walk back to the TARDIS, and the Doctor and General Stahl had to cross a desert. It was very hot. Here, said the Doctor, offering the General his flask of water. Have a drink. You're starting to look like a baked potato. I could not accept. A Santaran would rather go thirsty than accept a drink from an enemy. I am not your enemy, growled the Doctor. Well, it is proven from the show that some Santarans can be friendly. So, yeah. <laughs> As the sun was setting, they reached the high cliff. We will have to help each other climb to the top of that, suggested the doctor. I will climb it alone, said the general. The Santaran never accepts the help of an enemy. I am not your enemy, cried the doctor in exasperation. Yeah, insisting that someone's your enemy when they're not. Hmm, okay. Not a good idea. The doctor doesn't like to make enemies, but he has loads of them. General Stahl began to climb the cliff. But as the doctor had predicted, the Santaran could not climb on it, climb it on his own. He fell and twisted his ankle. We have an injured Santaran. Oh, oh dear. Here, offered the doctor, take my arm. We can rest here overnight. A Santaran never began the general. I know, I know, interrupted the doctor. A Santaran never takes the arm of an enemy. For the last time, I am not your enemy. General Stahl looked at the doctor steadily in the eye. Looked the doctor steadily in the eye. You are. Oh, I give up, cried the doctor. I just want you to go home and leave this planet in peace. As you can see, General Stahl has no intention of doing that. <laughs> okay. Leave this planet in peace? exclaimed the General. But that would be such a waste. They have the best sausages in the whole of the universe. The doctor looked at General Stahl in amazement. Do you mean that you invaded this planet simply because of their sausages? <laughs> Why else? answered the general. But, said the doctor, you do not have to invade a planet to enjoy their food. How else would we do it? asked the general. Well, let me think, snarled the doctor. Maybe you could just come for lunch? Yeah, that's a good idea. Just come for lunch and don't invade.
Really? said the general, his eyebrows shooting up across his expansive forehead. What? No fighting? No heroic deeds? No warfare? It sounds very boring. <sighs> Trust me, I know many of the doctor's enemies who would also think that. <laughs> so yeah, there you go. The next morning, the doctor and General Starr climbed the cliff together. As they scrambled over the top, a Sontaran guard appeared. Well done, General, said the guard. You have captured the enemy. Actually, said the General, it turns out that he is not the enemy. At last, cried the doctor. Now we can all have lunch. There's a Sontaran guard right there. And the Santaran general has finally relented. The doctor and all the Santarans sat down to a much longed for lunch. Sausages all round, ordered the doctor when the waiter came to their table. I'm terribly sorry, sir, said the waiter. I think they're going to be disappointed. <laughs> yeah, there you go. But we're all out of sausages. Dun, dun, dun. And I could just have seen that happening during a David Tennant episode of Doctor Who. <laughs> Why didn't it? <laughs> the sausage invasion. Anyway, that was Doctor Tenth. Join me for the anti-penultimate episode of this series, Doctor Eleven, next time. Until then, Alonzi! Hi, Miss. Hello, for Mr. Men fans and Whovians alike. It's time for episode 11 of the Doctor Who Mr. Men series. So that means I'll be reading Doctor Eleventh. Here we go. It had been a very busy day. A very busy day filled with danger. Even the doctor, whose life was filled with danger, could hardly remember a more unpleasant day. He sipped his tea, and then an awful thought occurred to him. Bother! I have left something behind, he said to River Song. We are going to have to go back and retrace our footsteps until we find it. Yep, there you go. There's the Doctor and River Song drinking their tea. And the Doctor remembering something. That he's forgotten. Don't be daft! Exclaimed River. I'm not going through all that danger all over again. Once was bad enough. But what I left behind is vital. Why don't we just go back in time and get whatever you have lost? Asked River. After all, we do have a time machine. The trouble is, I can't remember where in time I lost it. Explained the doctor. All right then, sweetie. Off we go. Yeah, so, I guess there's River now agreeing to go on the retrace. Quick, follow me, said River, climbing a wall. But that's not the way we went last time, said the Doctor. Maybe not, 
but we need to avoid the Zygons. What Zygons? asked the Doctor. Guess there'll be the Zygons behind them that look like cute little bunnies. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Those Zygons! called River as the two rabbits suddenly transformed into Zygons. Yowza! shrieked the Doctor, scrambling up the wall behind River. Yep, those are definitely Zygons. Well, for those of you who don't know, Zygons are these alien creatures in the Doctor Who universe. They can shapeshift. Yeah. Gosh, said the Doctor, following River across a rope bridge. You never knew when as you never know when a Zygon is going to pop up next. That's the trouble with Zygons, said River. One minute you're looking at a cute rabbit, and the next is a deadly Zygon. And there they are, the Doctor and River crossing the rope bridge. This way, sweetie, said River. Geronimo! cried the doctor as he tried to catch up. And look out for those Silurians, called River. The doctor pulled himself up and barely swung over his head. Their heads, River laughed. I don't know how you'd ever get along without me. Hmm, first Zygons, now Silurians. What monsters are going to crop up next? Let's see. I'm perfectly capable of coping on my own, huffed the Doctor, who promptly fell through a hole in the roof. Help! He cried. You were saying? Said River, jumping through after him. There's the doctor falling through the roof. There you go. And I guess uh, the doctor and River landed on the floor of an ancient temple. That's strange because the roof in the last picture looked like the roof of a house. Hmm. Any sign of what you're looking for? Asked River. No. But I do remember we came this way before. Look! So there they are inside the temple, and what's the doctor found? It's the weeping angels! Remember? Look, but don't blink. Blink, began the doctor, and we are dead. Yes, I know, I know, finished River. She and the Doctor cautiously made their way past the angel statues, making sure they did not take their eyes off them. Weeping angels! Okay, whatever next? <laughs> yeah, so there you go. To look away would have caused terrible trouble. One might say that, in the blink of an eye, they escaped the weeping angels, but one blink of an eye would have been enough to allow the statues to come to life and attack them. So there was no blinking of any eyes. Yeah, because this is what happens if you do blink. The angels come to life and start attacking you. However, once they had safely escaped the angels, they were faced with a new danger. Snakes! A whole pit full of snakes! I was really hoping you might have found what you were looking for before we got here, said River. I hate snakes! she added. So there's River faced with a pit of snakes. Oh, glorious!
There. It's not so bad, is it? cried the doctor. River gave the doctor a withering look. Whatever it is you have left behind had better be worth it. The snakes hissed in agreement, and River shuddered. Onwards and upwards, said the doctor, climbing up a vine out of the pit. Yeah, now River's actually neck deep in snakes while the doctor's climbing out of the pit. I remember this cave, said the doctor. This is where we saw that giant, this is where we saw the giant spider. Now, what did we do next? We ran, shrieked River, spotting the giant spider lurking in a corner of the cave. She and the doctor ran and ran and ran some more, as fast as their legs would carry them. Which, as you might imagine, when you are being chased by a giant spider, is very fast indeed. Oh dear, the spider has seen them and is now after them. They escaped the spider, and River was trying to remember what horror came next when the doctor suddenly stopped. Here it is, he cried jubilantly. And there on the ground was a hat, a fez hat, the doctor's fez hat. I don't believe it, exclaimed River. You made me go through all of that all over again for a hat? But it's my favourite hat, said the doctor sheepishly. Yeah, finding the fez. Hmm. The Doctor and River finally got back to the TARDIS. And for the second time that day they settled down to a nice cup of tea. In fact, there was nothing that they had not done for the second time that day. Gosh! exclaimed the Doctor. Where did I put my hat? River looked up in concentration. Uh, in consternation. And then she laughed. Oh dear. It's on his head! It's on your head, silly! And so ends Doctor Eleventh. That means there's only two more of these left to read, guys. And the next one will be Doctor Twelfth. Until then, thanks for watching. And Geronimo! Hey, fellow Whovians and Mr. Man fans alike, uh, welcome to the penultimate episode. That's right. Of the 13 Doctors collection, Mr. Men books. So, we now go on ahead to Doctor Twelve. Are we ready? The doctor leapt out of the TARDIS and ran as fast as he could to keep up with Missy. She had led him back in time to ancient Egypt. You're getting old and slow, Missy laughed. The doctor frowned. Old indeed. He was a time lord. He had lived for centuries. Of course he was old. So, there's the doctor and Missy having just arrived in ancient Egypt. But so was Missy, because she was also a Time Lord. I think that's Time Lady. The Doctor arrived inside the pyramid just in time to see Missy steal a scepter. from a sarcophagus. 
What is she up to? muttered the doctor. Up to no good, came the reply in the doctor's head. But that was an easy answer. Nowadays, it seemed like there was no good in Missy. She acted all bad, but the doctor knew better. Naughty Missy, what's she up to? Just like the doctor, Missy could travel through time, duh. But she used the vortex manipulator on her wrist. The doctor followed. Back in time. Back in time to the Tower of London. Now Missy was stealing the crown jewels. Stop! cried the doctor. But it was too late. Just for once, I wish I could arrive early, huffed the doctor in frustration. So there's the doctor trying to stop Missy from stealing the crown jewels. And failing. He followed her again through time to Japan, where Missy had stolen a gold statue. Too slow! cried Missy, and then she was gone. Okay, uh. There's Missy making off with the gold statue from Japan. She made off with that one. I think I'll call you Dr. Slow, called out Missy when the doctor caught up with her in Russia. Now she had stolen a jeweled egg. And there she is with the jeweled egg from Russia and the doctor catching up with her by way of his trusty TARDIS. The doctor was puzzled. Why was Missy stealing all these jewels? Were they Christmas presents? Ah, I see. On the first day of Christmas, the doctor gave to me a journey through time and space. So there she is putting presents underneath the Christmas tree. A Christmas story in February. <laughs> well, I never. <laughs> Was she going to open a jewelry shop? Oh, wait. No, maybe she's opening a jewellery shop. Was she going to sell them and buy a yacht and sail round the world? All of these thoughts seemed very unlikely to the doctor. Missy loved to cause trouble. The sort of trouble that might destroy the earth. Of course, thought the doctor. That is exactly what she's trying to do. Yeah, I'll say so. The doctor was not at all happy. He had just realised something else. All this chasing Missy through time meant he had missed lunch. And now he was hungry. But he had to keep going. Oh dear. Dear, oh dear, oh dear. Their next destination back in time was the Wild West. Missy had stolen a bag of gold dust. What does she want with that, I wonder? Well, soon to find out, hopefully. And then the doctor was in Paris. But he had forgotten to leave the horse in the Wild West. It was chaos. And in the chaos, Missy stole a diamond ring. Au revoir, sucker. <laughs> okay. Oh, 
finally, the Doctor caught up with Missy a very long way back in time, in the Stone Age. And finally, the Doctor was there in time. You got that right, didn't you? There in time, Time Lord, time travel. <laughs> but there in time to catch her out. You think I'm so sl you think I'm too slow to work out what you are doing, don't you? said the doctor. But I'm quicker than you think. The doctor then emptied a bag of cyber maps on the ground. You thought you could fool me by taking all those jewels? he added. I retraced our chase and found these cyber maps left behind in each box. Indeed, there they are. Average. Yeah. Okay. Well, clever old you. Do you know what my plan was? Asked Missy. Haven't a clue, said the doctor. All I know is that I've saved the world. But you have to allow me to explain my devious plan, whined, whined Missy. No, don't care. I'm off now. Yeah, that's the doctor for you. <laughs> Where are you going? asked Missy miserably. Back in time, replied the doctor. Back in time for something more important. But what could be more important than hearing all about my dastardly crime? cried Missy. I don't know. Lunch, perhaps? <laughs> Caught it. <laughs> Lunch. And that was Doctor 12. Now the final episode will be Doctor 13. And that's coming next. Until then, see ya. Okay, fellow Whovians and Mr. Men fans alike. We have reached the end of an era. The end of a series on the channel. The end of the 13 Doctors Mr. Men collection. Because we've come to the final book. Of that series, Doctor Thirteen. Here we go. Yaz was very excited. It was the day before her birthday, and she wondered what the Doctor and Ryan and Graham had planned. She had no idea. Now, this is Yaz, one of the 13th Doctor's companions. Now, the 13th Doctor on TV, as most of you know, is played by one Jodie Whittaker. So, that's her, waiting to find out what the others have planned. Funnily enough, the Doctor and Ryan and Graham had no idea either. What could they do for Yaz's birthday? Well, there's the Doctor in her beauty and glory. And that's Ryan. Another of the Doctor's companions. And that's Graham. Also another of the Doctor's companions. Played on TV by one Bradley Walsh. And Tosin Cole plays Ryan. How about a cake? Suggested Ryan. And candles and balloons, added Graham. Hmm, that's all a bit predictable, isn't it? Said the doctor. 
Not if it's a surprise party, said Graham. And not if it's a very cool cake and very cool candles and very cool balloons, added Ryan. So, there are Graham and Ryan getting all excited over this. But where will we get those? asked the doctor. Well, said Graham, we thought that would be your job, Doc. After all, said Ryan, we done the hard part coming up with an idea. Ah, they're in this, yeah, they're charging the doctor with the task of finding the bit. <laughs> For the party. The doctor groaned. But she wanted to make Yaz's birthday special. So off she went in the TARDIS. Yeah. Dun 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 She flew across space to the planet of Tontar, where she had heard there was a bakery which was a bit of a surprise as the Santarans were a terrible warlike people who liked nothing better than fighting. A bakery on Santar. Hmm. If you've been following the series, guys, you'll know who the Santarans are and that Santar is their home world. She bought a cake. A Santaran frosted boom cake. What is a boom cake? asked the doctor. A cake was a surprise in it, explained the baker. A surprise cake for a surprise party, said the doctor. That is perfect. The Santaran baker smiled. Aha! Uh -huh. Yeah, it could be a bomb in the cake. Are you that willing to believe it's a my surprise? <laughs> okay. The doctor set off again in the TARDIS in search of candles and balloons. She went back in time to London, back in time to the 1940s and the Blitz, where she found some balloons, some enormous balloons. Ah, uh, yeah. Those aren't balloons, they're zeppelins. Okay. <laughs> oh dear. The balloons were so big that they slowed the TARDIS down as it travelled above London. Again, they're Zeppelins. Not birthday balloons. TARDIS flew on further back in time to Paris, an old-fashioned Paris, lit by candles, where the doctor found just what she was looking for. Yeah, candles. Stealing them, though. Uh, those aren't birthday candles. The wrong type of cake, the wrong type of balloons, and the wrong type of candles. <laughs> Okay, what a surprise. The doctor then flew forward through time, back to Graham and Ryan. They could not believe their eyes as the TARDIS came into land, trailing the huge balloons. Again, Zeppelins. Not birthday balloons. And they were even more taken aback when they saw the cake and the candles. The cake had begun to bubble and froth. What is that? exclaimed Ryan. 
It's a Santarum frosted boom cake, said the doctor proudly. Yeah, not the sort of cake you should give someone for their birthday. And do you think a boom cake is a good idea? asked Graham. But it was too late to argue. Yaz had arrived. Happy surprise birthday! cried the doctor and Ryan and Graham in unison. And with a sonic screwdriver, the doctor lit the candles she had placed on the cake. Yeah, again, those aren't birthday candles, are they? It exploded with an enormous BOOM! Yep, you said it, or I read it. Covering the TARDIS theme in pink chocolate. Well, that was a nice surprise. I uh, don't think I'd like to be covered in chocolate, though. So I'll read it. <laughs> Maybe that's a happy boom day, laughed the doctor. I have to say, this tastes pretty good, chuckled Jazz. And so ends the Mr. Men 13 Dogwood Collection. I hope you enjoyed the series. For those of you who are Whovians, you would have enjoyed the fact that it was Doctor Who. And for those of you who are fans of Mr. Men, mainly the little ones, You'd have enjoyed the fact that it's Mr. Men. But for those who are fans of both. You get the best of both worlds in this collection. And if you've enjoyed hearing me read these. I recommend you get your own copy of the set. <laughs> Did I just review this? <laughs> Uh, okay. I thought I was acting fully booked, but, um, before it even started. Anyway. Until the next short series comes out. Although I will be going headfirst into Mr. Men to, to read the original series. And until next time, guys, there won't be a next time for the 13 Doctors collection, but there will for Mr. Men. Until then, thanks for watching. <laughs>